1949, I'm an old guy. I was only four years old at the time. The first article that we know anything about having to do with the use of ultrasound in humans came out from the Department of Defense from Dr. George Ludwig, who interestingly was using it to look for foreign bodies uh, after accidents in the battlefield, for example, where you can have things like glass or wood that are not radio-opaque so they don't show up on x-ray. He was hoping that this might be a way to actually be able to detect these, and it turns out you can. So this was kind of an early point of care, you know, the point of care thing we kind of is a new buzzword in ultrasound. But so the very first application was really sort of point of care. The difference was, of course, you had to be able to plug this oscilloscope into an AC power line, so it wasn't exactly portable. But um, so 1949, that was kind of the beginning of the concept. Now, when I started doing ultrasound in 1974, that was an ultrasound. We didn't have images. They didn't look like anything. There were these spikes on an oscilloscope. They were purely used to measure distance to some structure. This is actually measuring from the skull surface to the midline. This is the third ventricle in here, and then that's the far side of the skull and the hair on the other side. So um, ultrasound has come a long way in the length of time that I've been fortunate enough to be involved with it. Uh, this was an early ultrasound. That's uh, an early pregnancy where the green arrow is pointing to the fetus. This display is black or white. There's no shades of gray. So it's uh, what was called bistable, either on or off. And it was on an oscilloscope. If you wanted a permanent picture, you had to take a picture of the oscilloscope with a Polaroid camera. Well, if you compare that with what we can do now, where we have the 3D that we can rotate around, look in any direction, we have all the soft tissue and bony information, just remarkable how far it's come in you know, a relatively short period of time. So this is representative of a current high-quality ultrasound scan. This is a transvaginal ultrasound scan of an early pregnancy. And you can see a lot of things. And we'll come back to this same image a number of times for different reasons in the course of the talk. But so here's the embryo here. This little bright structure is the yolk sac right out at the periphery of the amnion. The fluid within the amniotic sac is echo-free. The fluid between the amnion and the chorion has some protonaceous debris in it, so it has some fine internal echoes. And then when we get out into the placental tissue and the, the muscle of the uterus, uh, different textures that actually are helpful to us in deciding actually what we're looking at and whether it's normal or abnormal. Now, in terms of resolution of current equipment, this is a picture of a fetal heart, the four chambers, two ventricular chambers, two atria here. And this is a nickel, and the heart is about the size of a nickel at 20 weeks. And 20 weeks is when we usually do the anatomic survey. Well, not only that, but we're able to see, in this case, a ventricular septal defect on color Doppler, where we're showing where flow goes. Flow crosses the septum, and that little defect is about the size of Jefferson's nose. So our resolution now is sub-millimeter in most cases. And when we talk about frequency and that kind of stuff, we'll talk about how we get to this level of resolution and what you have to do to maximize that on the equipment. Wow, we can even see fetal emotions on the 3D. This one's obviously frustrated. Uh, you know, here's one that's like Mr. Bill, you know, oh, no. Uh, the thinker, you know, my favorite one, a little combative action between the twins here. And uh, this one who's a little boy who's just discovered that he's a little boy. <laughs> well, okay, so I have to put in my profound statement. So the, the one who drinks water should think of the one who dug the well, supposedly a Chinese philosopher, who knows. But anyway, we should remember the people that let us get to where we are today. And the one that certainly got me here, and uh, Jim Ray probably too, who is our GE person with us today was this guy, Dr. Bill McKinney. He was a neurologist, the most enthusiastic person I've ever known. He could sell ice to the Eskimos and make them grateful for it. Um, he went on to become the president of the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine and pulled many, many people, some kicking and screaming like me, into this field, and we're very grateful to him for that. Uh, Dr. McKinney died not too many years ago. This was a gathering just before his death um, to honor his career at Bowman Gray, Wake Forest, where he spent his entire career. You can see me in the picture, but you can also see Dr. Kim in the picture long before we had any idea we'd be fortunate enough, enough to have him as a colleague at Texas Tech. So this was 10 years ago. Okay, sonar. 
you ain't got a thing if you ain't got that ping, if you're familiar with that. Well, anyway, the sonar equipment that was used in World War II, obviously, like with most things military, they made a lot more of it than it turned out we needed. The war ended, and there was all this surplus equipment around. This was actually a submarine I got to visit in San Francisco that's now a museum. And you can see the sonar equipment, just racks of equipment here. And this allowed you to steer the transducer, which is this thing up on the deck. So this pipe went up, came up here. And if you turned this wheel, you could actually point this thing in different directions. You had to do that manually. And then you could record the intensity of any incoming information and maybe figure out that there was another sub or a ship on the surface out there. Well, that same equipment ended up, this is at the University of Colorado back in the uh, 1960s. You can see the same equipment basically in this rack over here. And they borrowed this gun turret and filled it with water. And whatever they wanted to scan, since it was sonar, they figured it had to be submerged in water. So their subjects are holding lead weights to keep them from floating up. This actually made pretty good pictures. They had this automated transducer array that went around oscillating as it went around and it would make pictures of the neck and you can see all the strap muscles and the vessels everything else is really impressive but obviously not very practical for day-to-day -day patient care well in the evolution of things this life magazine article also from the 60s from Hahnemann uh, shows a lady getting an ultrasound scan in pregnancy and you can see there's this plastic bag filled with water so we still have what's called the water path concept and the display's fetal head is here on an oscilloscope screen. That was still pretty amazing because you could tell some things you couldn't tell before. Presentation, if you weren't successful with your Leopold maneuvers and figuring out the position. Well, then the equipment went on to become what we call contact B scanners. They found that you could get rid of the water path and just make contact directly with the skin. And this is me many years and a lot more hair ago. And if you look carefully up in the edge, that's uh, Jim Ray, who's your next speaker. So we came out of the same training program. I did not have anything to do with getting him here today, but I am so glad because he is, of all the people in the world that know the logic E, there's just nobody better. So we're very fortunate to have Jim with us today. Well, when I first came out here in 1977, that's Jim Ray again. He was one of my first two sonographers, so our track record goes way back. Again, what we're using here is a contact B scanner. Uh, had an arm that came out, an articulated arm that would keep track of the, where in space you were pointed. It was certainly not moving pictures. You just constructed an image by moving this thing across the body, rather like an Etch-a-Sketch, and uh, made fairly good pictures, though that one was actually by now had 16 or maybe even 32 shades of gray, so you could differentiate, for example, fluid or a bladder uh, from tissue like liver. Really not a bad piece of equipment. Uh, by the mid-1990s, we had this unit, which was from Toshiba, but the thing to notice is it has two monitors on it. By this time, we have real-time moving pictures, and we'll talk about how you do that when we get to transducers in a minute. But it had to have the two monitors because by now we were doing color Doppler. The color monitors at the time were not high enough resolution to display the grayscale images. So you actually had to have one, one monitor for the gray information and one for color information. And this thing, obviously, is the size of a of a good-sized washing machine. Well, even before that, people had been trying to miniaturize things. This has actually what's called a linear array transducer built into it, and it would make moving pictures on this little two-inch, maybe three or four shades of gray screen, and it was used at the bedside to look at heart or maybe fetal presentation or something like that. It was battery-powered, but the battery only lasted a couple of hours. Just never quite caught on. Just wasn't quite good enough for the job. Well, by the, oh, within the last five or six years, a lot of the manufacturers, including GE, started coming out with what basically look like laptop computers that have remarkable capabilities. Uh, again, by now, the screen resolution is good enough that we can do color and grayscale on the same screen. And uh, the controls are very logically laid out. Maybe that's why it's called the logic whatever. These logic E as in emergency, I guess. Uh, and so they started finding use like this from the Olympics back in uh, 2008 where, you know, looking for uh, musculoskeletal injuries, joint effusions, things like that. You could just have it right out there and uh, ready for immediate use without having to ship the person back to some central facility. And then they got smaller and smaller. It's certainly a lot of the manufacturers now have handheld units, and some of them actually the quality is, is not bad for if it's being used for the right 
purpose. They can't compete with the bigger equipment completely. This just announced this past November at the Radiologic Society of North America meeting is this little unit from Siemens that's under the Accuson brand name. The thing about this is the transducer over here has no cord. So this is essentially Bluetooth on steroids. It uses a very high frequency radio band so that it doesn't interfere with other equipment in the hospital. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, it's just nice to get rid of the cord, for one thing, like in any of the Bluetooth applications. But the other thing is, in, say you want to use it in surgery in the sterile field, you can just slip this little transducer, sterilize it first, clean it, put it in a sterile plastic bag, and then you actually have the controls that work the equipment on the surface. So you've got everything right there. No cord to contaminate or, or drag across things. So uh, people keep coming up with clever ideas.